is Jerry and welcome to my channel, Jerry in Stitches. If you're new to my channel, please hit subscribe, ring that bell and give me a thumbs up and I hope I'll see you for future episodes. If you're not new and you're back, I'm so happy, welcome back. In the last episode, I promised you guys that I would show you how I tie dyed my gathered tiered dress. And if you want to see how I self-drafted and sewed up this dress, please go to my previous episode. But today we're gonna focus on the tie dyeing process that I did for this dress. All these patterns that you see here on the dress are created by Shibori tie dyeing techniques, uh, which incorporate folding and binding. And even though it looks like there are many different patterns on this dress, all these patterns are actually made just from one folding technique. And this is what it looks like um, when you fold up the fabric just before you dye it. And I'm gonna walk you through how this is folded. You can see that it's actually uh, in the shape of an equilateral triangle, and then it's gonna be bound by rubber bands. I'm gonna show you how this one fold can create all these different patterns. And without further ado, let's jump right into it. The first thing to do is to prepare our fabric. Now, what kind of fabric should we get? Since we are using RIT dye all-purpose dye today, it means that for best results, we should stick with 100% natural fibers, uh, which means choose cotton, silk, linen, or viscose, or a blend of the above uh, fabrics that I just mentioned. So for example, today I've chosen to work with linen and this dress was made from a cotton silk blend. And I also made another dress for my daughter and this is 100% viscose. So choose wisely and kind of avoid the polyester for now, that would be best. Once we get our fabric, then we want to pre-wash it. Now, pre-washing does a couple of things. Number one, it shrinks up the fabric so that it's more accurate for our sewing needs. And number two, it removes whatever coatings the fabric comes uh, that is put on by the manufacturer. And it also means that when we are laundering the fabric, we shouldn't be using any fabric softeners because fabric softeners could prevent the fibers from really absorbing the dye. The folding techniques that I'm showing you today are actually very easy to do on smaller pieces of fabric. The tricky part comes is when we have to fold larger pieces of fabric uh, that are required for garment making. At the same time, we don't want to be handling really large pieces of fabric because that would make the folding almost impossible. So here's what I recommend. After choosing your fabric and after pre-washing, I would uh, suggest to cut up your fabric, uh, whatever width it is, into one meter or 1.5 meters in length. So for example, I'm working with a linen today and this is one meter long. And this is a good um, size of fabric to begin working with. And also it's a good size of fabric for any garment making purposes. Once you are comfortable folding up one meter long pieces of fabric, then you can work up to 1.5 meters long uh, for garments that would need that length. Okay, I think that's good enough of an introduction for the folding techniques. And right now we're gonna start folding. And the things uh, that you need for this, materials and tools required, are your fabric, number one. And number two, I use an iron and an ironing board to make my folds. And here's my secret weapon. Are you ready for it? I use these fabric clips that are used for sewing instead of pins. Now, if you don't have these fan fancy schmancy clips, you can just use regular clothes pegs. It will do the same job. And um, you need some rubber bands. <laughs> okay, so in order to fold up our fabric so that it starts from this to become this, we need to make our first accordion fold on the salvage or parallel to the salvage or grain line. So what does that mean? You wanna find the salvage of your fabric and you wanna fold your first accordion fold 
parallel to that line. Okay, before we go into folding proper, I also want to say that I like to um, close up the seams or finish the seams of the raw edges of my fabric so that um, it prevents unraveling when we're tie dyeing. And also, I like to press my fabric um, before I start folding. So after we make the first accordion fold, the fabric is gonna look like this. And I just want to show you the end point before we start uh, folding so you have an idea of where we're getting to. See, it's a form of pleating the fabric. Now, I like my uh, pleats or my folds to be uh, pretty much equal in uh, width. So that's why I'm using an iron and that's why I'm showing you this obsessive <laughs> compulsive way of, of folding these folds. You actually don't have to do it the way that I do. If you don't really care about um, how equal the width of your folds are, you can just fold it and pleat it up uh, however you want. But because I like the straight lines and um, I'm obsessive compulsive. That's why I'm using an iron. Now, um, I don't jump straight into folding accordion folds. This is uh, my tip. My tip is before folding the accordion folds, I make very clear lines of where to fold these accordion folds by first folding the fabric um, in halves until I get to uh, this final, uh, width which is usually between two to three inches wide okay so these are not accor accordion folds yet uh, but I do this first step and then I use my iron and I iron uh, down uh, to give me fold lines and these fold lines are gonna guide me into uh, how to fold uh, the accordion according to these creases uh, I hope you can see it on camera, but I think it's quite clear the creases that I made on the fabric after folding it in half again and again and again until I get to two to three inches wide for the folds. Now, I would stop here. I wouldn't fold anymore because smaller pleats are more difficult to fold when we come to the second fold that is required for the equilateral triangles. So, um, stop here and I'm going to change the camera angle so that you can see how I turn these into accordion folds. Uh, we're starting from the salvage end and as you can see some of these folds lend themselves into an accordion fold and then now I've come to a fold uh, that will not continue the accordion and what I do is uh, before I fold that fold, I use some of my uh, clips here and I clip uh, down the whole uh, length of the accordion folds. Uh, let's come back to, to this fold that is not uh, placed as an accordion fold. I use that as a guideline to fold it into an accordion fold. Here we go. Okay, and I keep my iron uh, close so that I can use that as a guide to fold up the fold, which basically needs to be turned uh, towards the other side. But it's much easier to do this because I already have that fold as a guideline. So uh, that is basically uh, the trick, you guys. I use these clips to help me keep the pleats uh, together. And I use these folds that I started off with um, that I created by folding the fabric in half lengthwise until I get to the width of the pleats that are required. And then I use those crease lines to help me 
make my accordion folds that are pretty much equal in length. Not accurately equal, but good enough for me at this point in time. And then I shift those clips to the other side once that fold is created, and that helps me keep the folds together. Um, this is actually very important to keep the fabric from shifting. And I use as many clips as required to get this task done. We're going to repeat this process of pressing, then shifting the clips to the other side of the folds to keep creating the accordion folds all through the entire width of the fabric. And no worries because this doesn't take long at all, just a little bit of patience. As you can see, I'm forming the last pleat or fold of the fabric right now. When this is done, we can move on to the second set of accordion folds to form this equilateral triangle bundle. But first, we have to remove all the clips. At one end of the accordion folds, I am measuring out and drawing in a square. The width of the folds is about 3 inches, and I mark the midpoint at 1.5 inches. I am also marking out the square so you can clearly see it on camera, and I'm using an erasable marker for this, and here's the midpoint of the width of the fold. Bring one corner of the folds to meet the midpoint we just marked. This immediately forms a little triangle, and we're going to make an accordion fold by lining up the shorter side of this triangle with the edge of the next fold. At the same time, this will line up the folded edge of the triangle with one of the long edges of the pleats we made from before. This also creates the first equilateral triangle in the series of accordion folds that we are making now. The folding pattern from now on is lining up one side of the triangle with one of the long edges of the pleats from before, and at the same time, the adjacent side of the triangle is lining up with the new accordion fold that you are making. We're going to keep repeating this folding pattern all the way down the length of the pleats. I'm changing up the camera angle here so that you see more clearly how this whole folding pattern is made. You see how a new fold is made lining up with one side of the equilateral triangle, and then immediately an adjacent side is also going to be lined up with the long edge of the pleats. So just keep repeating this until we get to the end of the pleats. When you come to the other end of the pleats, there will be a little flap, and that also needs to be folded to line up with the rest of the folds. Then this little bundle of joy is ready to be secured with rubber bands. I use three rubber bands, and each rubber band will pass through one point of the triangle and over to the side that is positioned opposite to that point. So that's the first one put in, and you want to go ahead and put in the second one, and the third one. These rubber bands also help demarcate the different sections for dyeing later. That completes the folding process, and these little bundles are now ready for dyeing. How exciting! Okay, people, it's time to put some color into our lives, and here's the tie-dye part of this tutorial. So first off, I want to introduce you to all the materials and tools that we need for this section of the project. And as I am gathering up all these things, I already have a pot of water boiling um, so that we can have hot water for the dyeing process later. I have about five liters uh, on the go right now. It might seem like I'm gathering things from my kitchen to use for the dyeing process, but that's a big no-no. You have to separate the equipment that you use for dyeing from the utensils that you use for actual food making. Okay, so all these I've bought um, at a dollar store. They can be found there very easily or at a cooking utensil store, but make sure that you set them aside away from your food making stuff. As I mentioned earlier on, we're using rich dye all-purpose dyes and the colors I've chosen for today are Scarlet, 
sunshine orange and golden yellow. <laughs> I also highly recommend getting the color stay dye fixative because this really helps in keeping the colors from bleeding out of the fabric after we dye them. So I'm using three colors but you can decide you just want to stick with one or maybe two or you can go with seven or eight. It's completely up to you. The only thing that you want to keep in mind is that when the colors overlap they blend together and they may create another color and you just want to make sure that this blending of colors is not going to produce a color that you don't want to begin with. So for example some colors um, blend together and they make a brown and if brown is not in your plan then don't do it so i suggest uh, to have some uh, paper towels on hand and you can do some testing uh, of the colors before you go ahead and decide uh, the number of colors you use and which colors would uh, sit next to each other so that the blending of the colors will turn out the way you want them to turn out we're using squirt bottles to apply the tie-dye techniques today and you want to go ahead and get one each for each of the colors that you're using today. You would also need a measuring cup and this measures 500 milliliters or two cups of water which is just the perfect amount to fill up these bottles which have the volume of 500 milliliters or two cups. Uh, I also went ahead and got a slightly larger bottle for the color stay dye fixative but you can just stick with the measuring cup if you don't want to get another bottle for the color stay dye fixative. The other things that I need for my tie dye setup are uh, gloves, very important because they help insulate your hands when you're handling hot water and also it keeps your fingers from uh, being dyed. Also, I have this setup of uh, a wire grid of some sort. This is uh, used for barbecuing. Well, I don't use it for barbecuing, but uh, I use it only for this tie-dye purpose. And uh, some kind of container that you can fit this wire grid over to catch the leftover or extra spillage of dye when we're dyeing. I also have uh, a measuring spoon so that I can measure out um, the amount of dye when I mix it with the water and you would need a tablespoon measuring spoon. For natural fibers that are cotton, viscose, rayon or linen, you would need salt to add into your dye solution. If there is any silk or wool in your fabric blend, then you would also need vinegar to add on to the dye solution. Another thing that we need is some clear plastic wrap and this is required when we are microwaving uh, the fabric after it is dyed. Um, and if you also have a tray that is microwavable that you can set aside only for tie dyeing purposes, then bring that out to use as well. I don't have something like this, so I'm just using a plastic bag to put in all my uh, fabric before I set it inside the microwave. Okay, my gloves are on to protect my hands. And I forgot to tell you guys that I also protect my furniture before I do my whole tie-dye setup. I actually have lined my table with some plastic um, covers so that my furniture doesn't get dyed as well. So don't forget to do it for your furniture. Um, okay, so gloves are on, the hot water is ready, and I've measured out uh, two cups. And I'm gonna start with the yellow. And so first just pour that in, okay, great, and then the salt goes in. Now I've measured up um, two tablespoons of salt that goes inside the bottle. And then now you want to shake up the dye really well. And we're going to use a, a measuring spoon. And somehow I've lost my tablespoon. So the spoon I'm using is half a tablespoon. So I would need four of these to go inside the bottle. Okay. And it's always good to have some uh, paper towels on hand to kind of clean up as you go. I want to make sure. All right. Okay, I'm going to close that up. 
And then we're going to cap it off. Screw it on really tight. Close, close it up if it has that cover. If it doesn't have that cover, then you can use a piece of paper towel, put it over the nozzle, and shake it up. So that will help you prevent some spillage. And, and I'm going to leave it aside. After shaking it a few times, I want to check to see if the salt is completely uh, diluted inside. I'm going to give it um, a little few more minutes. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, fill up my orange bottle. <laughs> I've gone ahead and mixed up the dyes for my red and for my orange as well, the same way that I did for my yellow dye. Before dyeing, the fabric has to be dampened. And the way I do it is to put it in a little bit of water in a tub, not too much to prevent overwetting. And I quickly soak each side of the bundle, then squeeze the excess water out of it. And this dampening helps with the fabric absorption of the dye, so don't skip this step. Remember I told you that this one folding technique uh, is able to produce many seemingly different patterns? Well, uh, what I actually mean is that the way that you apply the dye will affect how the pattern will look. Okay, so um, for example, some things are within your control and with tie-dye, some things you just have to surrender to the tie-dye gods. But the things that you can sort of manipulate is, for example, number one, how tightly you bind up the fabric. Actually, this is not as tight as it can go. Um, I can use stronger uh, rubber bands or more rubber bands to compress it even further. And when I do that, the dye, um, the dye job will produce very clearly defined lines for a um, pattern of a hexagon. So th this equilateral uh, triangle folding technique is going to produce very clearly defined lines of a hexagon if you bind it really tightly together. And then you will have quite a bit of uh, white uh, left in the fabric in proportion to the colors that you um, apply. The other thing that you can control is the application of color onto your uh, folded and bound fabric. So for example, one way of tie dyeing this is you can just throw this thing inside a, a tie dye vat. Okay, um, but we're using squirt bottles today because I want three colors, not just one. And I want to um, have some control over the placement of where the color is going to go. So for example, um, the way the rubber, band, rubber bands have divided up this equilateral triangle, um, I like to uh, divide this in thirds and apply the three colors equally divided. But you can decide that um, you want just two colors and divide this into half, or you want one color uh, less than the other two, or, you know, so you're completely the fabric designer here, and sometimes you don't really know uh, how the fabric patterns are gonna turn out, but that's kind of the fun of it. Okay, we're gonna start applying the color. How exciting. And I've, again, sectioned off uh, with the rubber bands and I, in this corner I'm going to start with the yellow and it's always best to start with the lighter color and then go progressively darker and um, I put the nozzle pretty close to the fabric and remember to hold this over the uh, wire grid so that the container underneath it can catch whatever color spills over and first, um, I'm going for a pattern that is, uh, has more clearly defined lines, let's just say. Okay, so as you can see, I'm placing my nozzle very close to the fabric, and I am um, dyeing this one-third corner of the... Ah! <laughs> it kind of went over to the other side, but that's okay. Uh, don't squeeze the bottle too hard and there we go
Okay, so that's the yellow. Very, as you can see, very little uh, went inside the um, container uh, that is uh, catching the spillage. It means that all that dye is going inside the fabric. Okay, hopefully. All righty then. Okay, and I want to saturate it as much as possible. Move on to the other colors if you have them, just like you did for the first. And so here goes my orange and the red. We've come to a point that there's quite a bit of drippage now, dripping, <laughs> drippage, <laughs> into the container um, underneath, which means that this is pretty saturated with color right now. And I'm going to leave that aside. Okay, so I've... Um, colored all these uh, three pieces of fabric the same way that I um, applied the dye to the first one. And I just want to show you um, what it looks like in between the folds, and I hope it catches on camera. If you peel it back slightly, you see there will still be some white left there. And here as well, somewhere in the middle, you see there's like white. Okay, so now I'm going to leave this one as is, okay, and which means that some of um, the patterns will have more white for this one. And for this one, I am going to see if I can uh, add on more. So what I do is I open up the folds, um, take a peek inside, okay, and I just add more in there. Oh wait, I used the wrong color. <laughs> this is yellow. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, all right. So I'm just gonna uh, go in between the folds and add more color in between the folds. Okay, so I'm gonna do it for all those colors. And hopefully what that is going to yield is that this pattern um, will have um, lines that are not as clearly defined. They would look more like blooms or blossoms. I decided that one of them um, is going to be completely saturated with all the colors so that we can see um, how different it is from the one that is not so saturated in between the folds. And then for this one, I decided to just saturate it um, with the yellow and the red so and i'm going to keep the orange as is and we'll see what that is going to yield we're going to put on the color stay dye fixative now and in my squirt bottle i've already um, added in hot water this bottle is larger than the ones that i was using and this is 750 milliliters and um, i'm supposed to put two tablespoons into um, 500 milliliters, so I would need to add an extra tablespoon here. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And one last spoon. Cap on! Shake this up. Okay. Basically, we're applying the color stay fixative um, the same way with the squirt bottle. Okay, all done with the color stay dye fixative. And after that is applied, you want to make sure that it kind of sits for 20 to 30 minutes before we wrap it up and put it in the microwave. Clear plastic wrapping time. So um, I'm going to take one of these and just wrap it like so the way you would your sandwich <laughs> and this step is pretty easy you just want to wrap all of them up like this okay make sure there are no holes when all three are wrapped up place them on a microwavable tray to zap them in the oven or use a plastic bag and this will prevent any leaking of dye in your oven make sure your bag doesn't have a hole Two minutes on high.
what's happening in the microwave oven right now is that the heat generated will be opening up the pores of the fabric even further so that the dyes can sink in even more. So uh, if you have any metalware that you have applied to the garment or the fabric, then of course you can't put it into the microwave. Instead, what you do is you leave um, your fabric wrapped up in the plastic wrap in the sun for one or two hours and that will do it. This is really super hot when it comes out of the oven, so be careful. And uh, we will leave it to cool down for a little bit and then we can do a cold water rinse. So the cold water rinse setup is the barbecue grill over the plastic container and then we're gonna use uh, the shower on cold and we're gonna just rinse them when they're still bound up like this. As the water is running down inside the container, you can see that the color is uh, coming out of it, which is okay. This is like excess color. And I've also prepared um, another container of cold water ready for these to be dumped inside after the first cold water rinse. As I was rinsing, I can see that the water is running pretty clear now when it's leaving these bundles of joy. So um, I think we're ready to unfold them or unbind them, which is always the best part of the whole tie dyeing process. And when they're like this, I'm gonna dunk them still sort of bound, okay? For the first dunk, I'm not gonna remove, um, I'm not gonna unbind them or unfold them yet. Okay, the barbecue thing has done its job. So here's a sneak peek of one of the fabrics I dyed. It's really pretty and I'll show it to you in its full glory later. In the meantime, I keep rinsing the fabrics so the water runs clearer, then I launder them. And for the first wash, I prefer hand washing with a gentle detergent and I let them hang dry or put them in the gentle cycle in the dryer. Ta-da! These are the fabrics that we tie-dyed today and welcome to my balcony. I feel like this tutorial has sort of been a house tour. You've been in my kitchen, in my bathroom, and now my balcony at sunset. <laughs> So, I wanted to give you a wide shot of all three of these fabrics for some um, comparison of the pattern that we were trying to make and you can immediately see that the hexagons are clearly um, defined in almost all uh, the three fabrics, just the patterning is slightly different. And this one is the one which is the less saturated one and you can really see that the lines of the hexagons are more clearly defined. This one was the one where um, I didn't add so much orange and this one was the one where we saturated all the colors. Okay, so I'm bringing you in for a close-up of the one that's less saturated. This one is where the orange uh, was not applied more than the others and you can actually tell uh, because the orange lines are more defined than um, the other lines in the pattern. You see like the uh, yellow is blurring a little bit more and so is the red. And then for this one, there's kind of equal blurring of all the lines. But it's also very pretty because there's some kind of uh, blooming or blossoming of the pattern. All that's left to do is to do a little dance with your newly tie-dye fabrics to thank the tie-dye gods for helping us through this process. And if you found this content helpful, please subscribe, give me a like, ring that bell, follow me on uh, Instagram at Jerry in Stitches, and I will see you soon for the next episode. Keep dancing, keep smiling, keep sewing, and I'm so happy holding a uh, fabric uh, in a this, this way. There are many patterns. It's this <laughs> natural fibers. Uh, that's also the most comfortable for. <laughs> and 
silk, uh, linen, or viscose rayon. <laughs> That's terrible. First fold of the... <laughs> we are essentially making folds... <laughs> we are essentially making our first... First? <laughs> In order to fold up a... Uh, ah, why can't I say it? Okay, so after pressing uh, the fabric... Um, somebody is knocking on wood! 